What's up, YouTube? What's going on, guys? So, uh, you just saw there the opening night, grand opening of US Iron Club. I want to put together a little clip montage just because it was such a fun time with friends. So, try doing the whole YouTube thing and, and doing some editing. But anyway, we're going to keep it informative here after two. Uh, this is my client, Liam, who actually lives in San Diego, pretty close to where the gym was in Garden Grove. So, decided to have him come out so we could work on him with some stuff in person. Kristen was also training that day. We're going to be talking about actually her hip hike and her squat shift that you can kind of see in this video is more apparent in some other ones, but also you can definitely see it in my video coming up here in a second where while we were squatting, we were very shifted from the uh, car ride. Our back, our glutes, our hips, everything got really tight. And I'm actually, I just filmed another video on how to get around this, how to prevent it slash fix it and uh, how it can be really dangerous. I actually, both of us were getting in a lot of pain, which I'll show you later um, from being kind of crooked in the hips. But you see how I'm kind of swaying to a side. It looks real minute, but it's actually huge. So I have a video coming out talking about that. But for today's video, we're going to talk about a few different things with like programming and stuff and, and certain things that we've been doing with Liam. Uh, first up, Liam. So he's building up here on squats. And this guy's been insane the last two months. He just started working with me two months ago and we're already hitting huge PRs on everything. Uh, we've adapted a lot and I wanted to talk about what we're doing to achieve that with him. Actually, in this next video, you'll see him, um, a comparison video. On the left is 420 pounds and same thing on the right. And uh, these are about two, three months apart. Uh, the one on the left is obviously after he started working with me, and the other one is uh, just before that. And so you can see how much harder this triple got for him just in a two blocks time. And mind you, um, that's a high fatigue day. So that's like a bad day for him on the left. So he's gained quite a bit of strength. And I think the main thing we really focus on with him was giving him more direction in his periodization as well as assessing his movement more. So what I mean by that is he was always actually really good about getting volume in. He's kind of a volume junkie. And anyone who's come to me for training knows that I'm huge on volume and that's how I progress my clients so quick. But with him, I wasn't expecting these huge results because he came to me showing me what kind of volume he's doing on the big three. Um, but what I found was actually his direction was really misled. He was way too focused on, on volume and the issue with that is if you don't direct the periodization correctly, where you have guided top sets that linearly increase throughout a cycle and you wave load it correctly, it doesn't end up working out the way you think it does. And that's really the biggest thing we've done with him is focus on the periodization. And I wish so many of my followers, so many of you guys would actually learn more about programming so you can understand more of this. Um, he had some confusion there on that, that squat set. He thought I told him to rack it, but I didn't. So this is 446, his old second attempt at a meet. Uh, and he's hitting it for a pause single on kind of a crappy day. It was like 100 degrees in that gym, so we we're dying. But um, man, yeah, he's he's seen insane progress. And I think the biggest thing for him was he just got really focused on movement and the periodization. Now let's talk about the movement stuff. This is him pulling conventional, watches back, kind of gives out there, slow lockout even at a really sub-maximal weight. When he pulls conventional, he gets really rounded over. And he's always been slightly strongest like this, but when he came to me, he was trying out a hybrid sumo. At first I liked it, but then we saw the same problem manifest at higher intensities. So recently we switched him to this, and this was actually the first day we ever had him go heavy on sumo. And so now he's doing a more traditional sumo, and you'll see he has a very naturally kyphotic posture. He's kind of rounded over. And this is something we're gonna fix. This is nowhere near perfect, but already he's hitting weights on his sumo that are going faster than what his conventional is doing. He built up to, I think, to the 460-ish range on the kilo plates on a power bar, and uh, they were flying up. And the thing that I really assess on him is he has crazy strong quads, uh, his back always gives out, and uh, we need to create more neutrality and uh, rig um, rigidity in his back. And the best way to do that was through a sumo position. He has such a hard time getting his back neutral that I figured it'd actually be easiest in a sumo position due to the uh, less mobility restriction in that posterior hip capsule. And then on top of that, we really focused on, on having him use his strong quads. So it's a decently wide, or excuse me, decently narrow sumo stance for now. We may widen this over time, but we're really just utilizing his strong points. And so I just wanted to showcase that you can gain quite a bit of strength strength with just getting some some quick direction on programming with your periodization as well as really assessing your movement 
And and these are the things that no one gives love on the internet for. They they go for some special goofy program or some you know crazy new secret you're gonna do to change your gains. And it was really simple stuff. Yet he's hit humongous PRs in just two months time under me. Uh, and he's already decently strong. I mean he's not the biggest guy in the world, and he's squatting in the mid fours for reps. You know what I mean? Um, so this is Kristen. She was building up on squats. She also was dealing with some pain today, but she got through the squats pretty well. Uh, I believe this was, babe, how much weight was this? My girlfriend's right here as I'm recording this. 232. Um, and we're pretty sure, given the circumstances, that's kind of like a lifetime PR, how it moved. Um, she probably had another three reps left in her at least. You can see I was real happy there at the end. And then she did some back off volume. So the biggest thing with her though, is keeping her healthy and organizing her programming around what's gonna keep her moving, which we also did a video on that today. That's what I was talking about with the hips and, and evening those out. You can see that shiftiness in her squat here. This is her back off volume. But also what's gonna make sense for her from a strength standpoint. So what we decided for her this week is we are gonna change the process of the program. Right now we're having her do a lot of heavy singles on deadlifts. She's great at lower uh, intensities and volume on, on her sumos. She's hit like a ton of weight for volume pause sets and and but the second she gets up to high intensity, she has huge issues staying in position. And so a big programming change we're making and, and that right there was I think around 300 pounds and this one I think is a, somewhere uh, about 309 or so and the next one should be about 331, something like that. But um, the biggest change we're making with her is actually just giving her a ton of what she sucks at and that's gonna be heavy sumo uh, deadlifts. And so we're giving her singles one week and then the next week she's gonna do volume work. And we're gonna go back and forth like that. And it's too hard to explain the semantics of how I'm gonna do that with detail in just this short video. But it's something you guys can think about there. What I really wanna showcase in this video is just how good, um, or, or how well I can set up a program based on what makes sense for the athlete and how there is no one way of doing things. You can see right there, she actually gave up on that deadlift and this next one because of hip pain. And that's what I was talking about. You gotta do what's right for um, the athlete. Or that drive honestly just killed us out. And you can see here, she's going lighter, more knees forward. She's being less explosive. This is a way lighter load, but we had to work through some of that hip pain. And so anyway, what I was explaining is, is basically think process and orient your program around what makes sense for the person. Too many people get emotionally attached to their program and don't want to do the things that are going to help them most, or they think there's one way to program. And that, honestly, the more I coach, the more I'm realizing it's process oriented and we got to change things on the fly more so than it is a perfectly laid out program that can go very wrong. Now, I'm not saying deviate from a program, but you get what I'm, I'm kind of getting at here is, is design the program to be extremely individual around uh, the lifter. Now me here, look at this horrible, ugly hip shift. Thank God I filmed this video today because I see a lot of people deal with this and it, it actually manifested in a huge amount of pain and I had to cut back my top set as well. This is my top set, I think it was only 517 I believe because I was using a kilo bar. So um, I think it was 517, one of you USAPL leaders correct me in the comment section. <laughs> but uh, I had this for an easy triple and I actually controlled this more than usual because of the pain. But I think I could have squeaked out even 530, 525, somewhere around there for a clean triple at RP8. I gave up pretty early on this one. I think it was probably around RP7. I was supposed to go up to an eight. But you can just see that that hip di uh, height difference in the hole. Like look at my, my hips. You see how they literally look slanted and then I shift on the way up. That was from that car drive and, and just fatigue from the programming itself. And the way to get around that is, is kind of uh, twofold. So I'll explain that in the next video that comes out for you guys. Then I had some deadlifts. Now what I wanted to talk about with these deads was how I pull in the off season compared to competition and if rounding your back in the deadlift is dangerous. What you'll notice here is now that I have my belt on, I'm going a lot heavier on my deads because I'm getting closer to my meat. Uh, I'm pulling with a flex spine. This is on purpose. However, I do this a very specific way to prevent injury for the most part. Now, there is still a risk like this. I don't want to say this is risk-free, but I also think the subject's very taboo, and a lot of people are afraid of talking about this because it becomes one of those controversy topics and people just like to dodge it. But in the powerlifting world, you'll see guys all the time pull it around it back, especially conventional pullers, and it's just kind of accepted, yet the mainstream seems to have this horrible view on, on rounded back deadlifts. Now, what I will say, um, there is a point where if you're a beginner or an early intermediate, you should be pulling your deadlifts with 
a very neutral spine or at least working towards that if you cannot. But when you get to be a higher level power lifter, like right here, I'm pulling the 629 for a triple. You can see before I even set the reps up uh, or set up the first rep, I started with a flex spine. This is to increase my leverage and I happen to not suffer at lockout from this. And it's always given me extra pounds on the bar. In fact, I probably get a good solid two to 3% bump on my deadlift by pulling in this manner. Same thing here for the 620 dead on a kind of stiffer bar. Uh, I kind of start in a slightly flex position. Now, what we know about this is that end range flexion is dangerous, okay? So the last few degrees of flexion, especially in the lumbar spine is very dangerous and that's where you're at the biggest risk and we'll never reach there. Um, we also know training like this probably all the time isn't the smartest. So you'll see here, I'm pulling with a very neutral back and I'm actually going beltless and this is what my off season pulling style kind of looks like. And this is what I would encourage most people to adopt. If they are going to pull with a rounded back, I would encourage them to do that more closer to meets. But when they're building volume, work capacity, I would focus more on like getting a neutral back. And that's kind of what I'm doing here. Um, even as I get set up for that one, you can see I start a little bit rounded, but I really worked into a more neutral back as I went. Now, end range flexion is really dangerous. And also flexion that increases during the lift. That means the muscle bellies are losing tension and a lot of the time that tension is going to go to the joints and they're going to sprain. And that actually ended up happening to me and I have a clip in here somewhere where I'm going to show that. But whenever we lose that tension mid-lift, that's a huge um, risk factor for you getting injured. Okay, And so what I have adopted is a system to avoid this. Now I used to get hurt when I would pull like this and I worked my way around it. And again, it was never like a disc herniation. It was never any traumatic injury, but there were, were some times I would get a really stiff kind of aggravated spine, maybe even a bulge disc. I don't know. As of right now, I don't have any. So that means they've healed up if I did. But what I've adopted is a very hard brace and I've learned how to work into this. So for more advanced athletes, if you can prevent flexion during the lift, so where your back doesn't round over more as the lift continues, and if you can prevent yourself from hitting end range flexion, we know you're probably gonna be a lot safer than if those things happen. We also know that neutral is, is very much a range and not so much a pinpoint area, okay? So like, what is neutral? What does that even mean? If you're one degree out of perfect neutrality, are you rounded over? No. If you're five degrees out of that, how dangerous is it? So there is a range here, okay? And that's what we have to work with in and, and find what's acceptable for your body and not going to injure you and how to brace into that. And if this is something you should even do, some people are actually weaker with a rounded back. Some are stronger. There's a lot of factors here, but what I will say is generally speaking, you're never actually going to see too many power lifters get hurt. Now, this video is um, a perfect example of what not to do. This was after an eight hour car ride down to Southern California. The first time I went up there earlier in the year, watch the first rep, braced hard. Even though I was explosive, kept good tension. Second rep was a little yanky. Watch this third one. Watch how I boom, yank. You saw that explosion? I dropped the rep right there because I sprained my back. Now, it was just a minor joint sprain. It was nothing major. But what I ended up doing was um, I, I, I got really stiff on my back. It locked up on me. I had to like barely like move around the gym just to get it moving again so I could even get into the car and get out of the gym and get home. And I had to do these things. And it ended up healing in like two weeks. It was just a typical joint sprain. Um, the signs to look out for if you ever do get hurt like that is if you lose control over your bowels or you lose sensitivity anywhere down in your lower half, those are signs you should go to the hospital. But again, I've actually never met one single person in person that's ever actually had a traumatic herniation or disc injury or anything like that. And again, what I'm saying here is if you're a high level power lifter and you want to know how to safely adopt a pulling style like this, maybe I'll, I'll do a video on that in the future, but there is a safer way to pull. However, it's not completely risk-free and that's something that you have to decide if you're willing to do that or not. But again, I don't think it's as risky as a lot of the general population thinks. As long as you avoid end range flexion, the flexion doesn't worsen as the lift continues. And if it does, that's when you just got to put it down. And as long as you're keeping tension and really keeping a brace and that spine is really locked in and you're in what I would call your safe rounded or your safe like more open-ended neutrality, you're probably going to be good. If you see me from the side, my lumbar spine is really not that rounded over. It's just slight. And it's the mid upper back where I get most of that curvature in the spine and where I'm really kind of trying to leverage myself into position. Okay. So I just wanted to do a video and kind of touch on this. I feel like it's a, a subject that has so much taboo around and people are, are just afraid to give their real opinions on this. So if you guys have any more questions about that, leave it down. I can do further videos on this about how I go about doing this and transitioning from my neutral back to around 
rounded back deadlift and why I don't think it's for everyone, but for some powerlifters, it could be better. Give the video a thumbs up, guys. And until next time, I'll see you later.